In this video, I'll be covering everything you need to know to start tracking macros today. If you typically procrastinate something until you have every single detail first, then this is the right video for you. The truth is, I wish I had this video when I first started working out 10 years ago. I could have avoided extreme weight rebounds, developing a pretty toxic relationship with food, and understanding it's not this serious. So today I'll be taking you through everything you actually need to know to start counting calories and macros today. So what's a calorie? In the context of nutrition, a calorie represents the energy that our bodies extract from food and beverages for sustenance and daily activities. Think of calories as fuel for your body. Just like a car needs fuel to run, your body needs calories for energy. When you eat food, your body breaks it down and uses the calories to power everything you do, from moving, to thinking, to growing. You only gain calories by eating. When it comes to burning them, it's a bit more complex, but we'll get into that later. So if you consume the same amount of calories that your body is burning, then you're considered to be at maintenance, and your body will generally keep the same weight and distribution. If you consume more calories than your body is burning, then you're considered to be in a caloric surplus. And over time, you'll gain weight as your body stores the extra calories as fat. Or if combined with resistance training, you'll partially use some of those extra calories for muscle growth. If you consume less calories than your body's burning, then you're at a caloric deficit. And over time, you've guessed it, you'll lose weight. Now an important note on calorie deficits, we've all started a diet in the past, started losing weight, and suddenly hit a plateau where nothing's changed, but we're no longer losing weight. This is called metabolic adaption. And basically what it means is our bodies are really good at adapting how they burn calories in order to bump us back up to maintenance. And in order to sustain a calorie deficit over longer periods of time, we need to adapt our consumption and exercise levels. Calories are broken down into three main macronutrients, protein, fats, and carbohydrates. When it comes to body composition, protein is the most important macronutrient. It keeps you full and is essential for building and maintaining lean muscle mass. Every one gram of protein is four calories. Next, we have fats, which are the most energy dense macronutrient, meaning that for every one gram of fat, it's nine calories. Because of this and the different types of fat that exist, they typically have a bad reputation, but they're necessary for things like cell growth, protecting your organs, and aiding in nutrient absorption. So you need them. Finally, we have carbohydrates, which just like protein, every one gram of carbohydrates is equal to four calories. And basically, carbohydrates provide quick and sustainable energy. So if you want to get through tough workouts, you need a good amount of carbohydrates. Now that we understand what a calorie is and how it's broken down into macronutrients, the next step is to calculate our personal caloric intake pro breakdown. The first step here is to decide on a goal, whether that be gaining muscle, maintaining, or losing weight. I know it's tempting to choose more than one, and depending on where you're at in your journey, it may be possible to lose weight and and gain muscle, but it's still important to prioritize the one that's most important to you. If your main goal is to build muscle, you'll want to take your maintenance calories and increase them by 5 to 25%. If your primary goal is to lose fat, then you'll want to take your maintenance calories and reduce those from 10 to 20%. The more weight you have to lose, the higher the deficit. That being said, the general science-based cutting rule is you should aim for 0.5 to 1% of your average body weight per week. That means for me, weighing in at around 210 pounds, I wanna shoot for one to two pounds of body weight per week. And I wanna emphasize how important that is. There's so many seven, 10, 30 day challenges out there, but the truth is it's so important to take your time, not only for your physical health, but also your mental health. I suffered a lot of all or nothing mentality and I've done the, the extreme dieting in the past and it never works out. What you end up doing is over committing, not being realistic, and then just hating the entire process and building a toxic relationship with anything that has to do with nutrition, fitness, or dieting. So do yourself a favor, stick to that 0.5 to 1%, make the journey enjoyable, make it sustainable, make it healthy. Now, I mentioned maintenance calories, but in order to know whether we are increasing or reducing them, we need to know what those are. Now, the formula that I've typically used is taking your body weight and multiplying that by an activity level. This activity level ranges from 14 to 18, with 14 being someone that's mostly sedentary, sitting at a desk all day, and 18 is a college athlete that spends all day training and running around. Don't overthink this number. And if you are, just choose somewhere in the middle. So 16. Now the reason you don't want to overthink this number is because it's just the ballpark. Just use it as a starting point. You then want to take the first two weeks as a trial period where you weigh yourself every day at the same time without any food in your system. And you take the average of it every week. If after those two weeks, you're maintaining the same weight, then you hit the nail on the head and you've successfully calculated your maintenance calories. Now we have a clear picture of how many calories we need to consume for our goal. The next step is calculating the max 
macronutrient breakdown. When it comes to calculating macronutrients, I typically start with protein. In order to keep things simple, my advice is to set your protein anywhere between 0.65 to 0.9 grams of protein per pound of body weight when you're trying to build muscle or strength. Whereas for fat loss, I typically advise going higher to prevent muscle loss and keep the range between 0.75 to 1.2 grams, typically trending higher the more experienced you are. Then moving on to fats, the recommended range is typically 20 to 30% of total calories and finally round it out with the rest of your calories as carbohydrates. Note that this is just a rough estimate and is going to vary from person to person depending on body composition, activity levels, and much more. Now I know all of this might sound like a lot of math, a lot of calculations, but there's two points I want to make on this. First of all, it's not as hard as it seems. I've included links in the description for calculators where you just need to plug in certain numbers and it pops out all of the information you need. Secondly, yes, it might take some additional prep, but the way I like to think about it is if there's somewhere I want to go, yeah, it might be faster at first if I just grab my keys, jump in my car and start driving. But eventually I'll probably get lost. I'll make a wrong turn and then I'll have absolutely no idea how to course correct and how to get to the right place. Whereas if I spend a little bit of time looking up the address or plugging it into GPS, it takes a little bit more time up front, but I then know exactly how to get where I'm going. And if I make a wrong turn, it automatically redirects and keeps me on track. So I don't know if that analogy is useful or relevant, but I hope you get the point. Also, if you don't want to do, if you don't want to run through the calculations or even plug it into the calculator, then you also have the choice of getting a personal trainer or a registered dietitian that can do all of this for you. Do still think that there's power in doing it yourself, even if you do seek the help of someone, because then that empowers you to fact check and make sure that they don't just give you a cookie cutter PDF file. I know it's happened to me before and it's happened to a lot of people I know. So you now have the tools, it's up to you to decide what to do. So now you have a full understanding of how many calories, protein, fats, and carbohydrates you need. You understand all of the theory. So let's head into the kitchen and check out the more practical side and see exactly how it looks like for you to track your macros day to day. The first thing I want to start with were nutrition labels. And these are going to be on the back of pretty much any item you pick up from the supermarket. Not a glance, they might seem overwhelming. But let's take it step by step in order of importance for what we need to look for. Now the first thing I recommend looking at when you pull out a nutrition label isn't the calories, which are noted in big bold letters. The most important part of this whole label is going to be a couple lines above in the serving size. And the reason why is because none of the information on this label is relevant if you don't know or have the correct serving. This reason alone is one of the main reasons I recommend counting calories and macros to every beginner. Because if you're anything like I was when I started exercising, I had no idea what a portion really was. To me, a portion of cereal was just a bowl. And I didn't find out for a while that I was actually consuming three to four times the amount of servings every time I sat down to have a bowl of cereal. Not understanding correct portion sizes is one of the main reasons why there's so many people out there eating healthier, cleaner foods and still not seeing any results. It's probably because you're having two to five times the amount of servings that's listed on the back of it. All of the numbers on the label are going to be determined by that serving size. Now, don't worry about the math and having to multiply things to two times three, because in a bit, we're going to get into how to log these into an app that does all that for you. After looking at the serving size, you can then take a glance at the overall calories. If you're counting macros, then you can entirely skip this line. You don't really need to know the exact calorie count because when you add up all of the macronutrients, that'll give you your total calories. So you can skip the calorie line and go down and look at total fat fats, total carbohydrates, and protein. These will give you numbers next to them by grams, and it'll just tell you that macro breakdown of one portion or one serving of this item. For example, for this yogurt, we have one serving is three-fourths cup or 175 grams. Now for each 170 grams of this yogurt, we're gonna get zero grams of fat, 10 grams of carbohydrates, and 14 grams of protein. So then you have your serving size and you have your macronutrient breakdown. And that's essentially all you need to know. But there are different types of nutrition labels out there. So I want to go through those two. Some nutrition labels might look a little bit like this. Essentially, they have two different columns with different values for each of the macronutrients. The only change here is a serving size. Some food items give the macronutrient breakdown and calorie breakdown for the entire container and then just for a single serve. When you're looking at this label, just make sure you start on that serving size so that you understand the numbers that are underneath. Another variation are those that require additional ingredients, like this pancakes. Now, in order to make this pancake mix, you need to add some type of liquid, typically milk, 
So sometimes the nutritional label will include the overall calorie breakdown of 2% milk or a specific type of milk. When that's the case, it'll generally have two different columns, one of just the powder and one of the 2% milk. I typically recommend just going with everything separately. If you're gonna be using a milk, that'll have its own nutrition label and that way you just keep everything separate and it makes things a little bit simpler. Lastly, some items are a little bit too small and don't have a nutrition label on them. So you can typically look for a barcode that most apps can then scan and they'll give you all of the information directly on that. We'll get more into the apps a little bit later. Now, I did wanna take a second to make a quick disclaimer when it comes to nutrition labels. In this video, I'm focusing on how to count macros, how to count your calories, and I'm not getting into the specifics of healthy ingredients or whole foods or the different nutrients that are in food. That's a whole nother topic. And if you have any dietary restrictions or health concerns, then there's definitely a lot more value that you can get from these labels. I'm mostly speaking to beginners that tend to over-optimize and think that they have to eat the perfect foods in order to get started. For those, just focus on those calories and those macronutrients and you should be fine to get started and you can optimize over time. All right, now that we understand nutrition labels a bit better, we're gonna need one of these a food scale. And they're not that complex. Essentially, they're just a tool used to measure the weight of different foods. In order for you to hit those serving size, the most efficient way is to use a scale. So again, you understand that you're getting the exact portion or as close to that portion every time you eat. When it comes to scale, there's different variations. There's digital scales, there's analog scales, there's pocket scales and big professional scales. This is just a $15 scale from Amazon that I'll link down in the description. You don't need anything fancy. I typically go with digital just because it's a little bit easier to read and faster to punch in, but take whatever you have at home and it'll work just fine. Now, when it comes to the actual scale, it's not too hard to figure out. There's essentially two main buttons on the whole thing. First thing is you wanna make sure you have it on a flat surface, just to ensure that the weight is distributed even and you're getting accurate readings on your scale. Placing it on that flat surface, you're gonna have two buttons on most digital scales. One's gonna be the power button, the other's gonna be the units. And once you turn it on, it'll just zero out and it'll show you a reading of zero because there's nothing on there. Now, the unit button is essentially to toggle between the different units of measurement, which you can match to those serving sizes that you see on your nutrition. Just makes things a little bit easier. You look, if it's in grams, then you put your scale in grams and you can measure it out exactly the same. Now, finally, the Tari or Tari, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but the Tari button, which is usually located on the same power button, basically just to zero it out once you place something on the scale. So this is essential if you don't wanna just pour things directly onto your scale. So if I have this granola right here, if I want to pour myself a bowl of granola, and I don't want to pour it all over the scale, I'll place a bowl on the scale. But if I put a bowl on the scale, that throws my reading off because now it's showing the weight of the bowl. So I then have to hit that tar button to zero it out. Now, anything that I add on doesn't account for the weight of the bowl or item that I place on. So you can do this, whether it be for bowls or if you're pouring multiple things into the same bowl, you can just zero it out after each one. Just make sure that you log those somewhere so you don't forget what that number is. While we're talking about scales, one item that I didn't want to talk about is there are some items that are a bit weird to measure because you don't want to pour them into a bowl or you don't want to measure out everything before putting it somewhere. One example is peanut butter. Have it on a knife, it sticks to the knife and it's just a weird experience. So another option you have is instead of pouring things on is to remove items from the container. So essentially what that's going to look like is you're going to place it on the scale. You're going to tar it out just like you did with the bowl beforehand. It's going to now read zero. So what happens now is anything I now take take out of this container, it's gonna reflect on the scale as a negative number. So just ignore the negative and that's your portion size. So if I need 24 grams of peanut butter, I grab a spoon and I remove peanut butter until it reads negative 24. And I now have 24 grams of protein without too much mess and too much complication. One of those things that just makes it a little bit easier to measure everything. One last point I wanna make with the scales is don't overthink it. Although it's helpful to be precise and to understand exactly what a portion is, you don't have to go overboard with it. It doesn't mean that if you're one gram or half a gram, even 10 grams over when you're pouring something in that you have to then take a tweezer and take every extra piece out. It's not that serious. It's, it's really not. And lots of people use that as an excuse to never even get started. The truth is if you're in the vicinity of a portion, then you should be fine. Even if you're a couple grams over, grams on. And eventually you might not even need to use the scale at all. Once you retrain your brain and understand exactly what a portion or two looks like of a certain food item, 
them, then you can then ballpark it. And again, you know, okay, that's about a serve. The main benefit of this is you're retraining your brain to understand what portion sizes actually look like. So eventually you might not even need the scale at all for most things. All right, now that we understand how to read nutrition labels and how to weigh out the food, the last step is actually logging them so we can keep track of it throughout the day. For this, I'm gonna need my phone. So let's jump in. All right, now we've weighed out all our food, time to log it in. For this, I'm gonna be using my Fitness Pal. There's a lot of good apps out there today, but this is the one I'm familiar with, and I know there's a free version that has all the features you'll need, so that's the one I'm going with. They do have a paid version, which allows a little bit more flexibility, but I've never paid for it, I've never needed it, and neither do you to get started. Additionally, they do have a website that if you don't wanna download the app on your phone for whatever reason, you could just log on to myfitnesspal.com and do all of the same things there. So to start things off, the first thing we wanna do is set our calorie goals in the app. So we're gonna go down into more on the lower right section of the app and then tap into goals. Once we click into goals, there's going to be a top portion talking about the starting weight, current weight and goal weights. And we can essentially ignore this first section. This is a way for MyFitnessPal to automatically calculate your calorie and macro breakdown. But I typically recommend calculating that yourself and then just inputting it directly into the app. So we're gonna jump over that and head directly to the nutrition goals where it says calorie, carbs, protein, and fat goals. Now the calorie section is going to be where we input our goal calories. That was 2,714 calories. I rounded it up here to 2,715. So I already have them in there, but if you don't, then you just go in, type in the amount of calories, click the check mark here. Now for the macronutrients, unfortunately the unpaid version of my fitness pal is a little bit annoying and only lets you modify the percentages and not the actual grams, but it's not that big of a deal. As long as it's roughly around the same numbers, then you're more than fine, especially if you're just beginning. If you want to be hyper specific and get the exact grams, then you could make that monthly payment. Or I'm sure there's an app out there that allows you to do this for free. Now going back to my calculations, my macros had come out to protein 260 grams, carbs 280 grams, and fats 60 grams. This is essentially 40% protein, 40% carbs, and 20% fat. So that's what I put here into the app. I could go 35% protein and 40% carbs, and I also get roughly the same numbers, but I'm a little bit closer to 40, 40, 20. So even though they're not exactly the same as the ones I calculated, it, they're in the same ballpark and that's a perfect starting point. Now that we've set our goals, we can then go back into our dashboard and we're gonna have the total calories displayed here. If we click into this box here, we then have three tabs which will help us keep track of our daily intake. An official view I find is the middle tab where it says nutrients and here we can see our protein, carbs, fats along with other nutritional information with the total amount we've consumed along with our goals and how many we have left for the day. So throughout the day, whenever I'm having going to be having a new meal, I'll typically jump into this nutrition tab here and just see, okay, how many grams of protein, carbs, and fats do I have left? I input the meals and then I determine whether or not this is a reasonable meal for me to have. Additionally, the macros tab here allows you to see the percentage breakdown in a pie chart so you can understand exactly what your breakdown is looking like so far and how close you are to that 40, 40, 20, or whatever percentages you calculate for yourself. Now you have everything set up and good to go. The next step is just is log the food. So down here you can tick on the second menu where it says log food and essentially what you have here is the food diary. Everything's broken down into breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. It doesn't really matter where you break it down into. The most important part is going to be your calorie consumption and the distribution of how you consume those calories isn't going to be as important if important at all. That's another controversial subject I'll probably get into in a future video but here we're just focusing on getting this amount of calories. So it doesn't matter if we get it in breakfast, lunch, or dinner or if you log something that you had for breakfast and dinner doesn't matter. So let's take an example here. Let's say I had Greek yogurt with some granola for breakfast. I would then take go to breakfast and click on add food. And here I can now search for the specific food up here on the search bar on the search bar and I could tap in Greek yogurt. Mine was a Dan and Light and Fit. So I have Light and Fit Dan and right here. Click this. I can see and confirm the macronutrient breakdown along with serving size if I modified that at all. For me I had 1.5 servings. So I can just put that in. If you only had one serving you just put one serving here and you can modify what that looks like. Then you just click the check mark on the upper right hand corner and that food's been locked. I did have some granola with this, so I'll click again. This was bare naked vanilla granola. Click on there. As you can see here, here I only had half serving. I look at the macros, that looks correct comparatively to the nutrition label that I had. So I can say that this is accurate and I can add this. And just like that, my breakfast has been logged. I can see how much total calories I have. And again, if I wanna see the macro breakdown, I click, click on this calories remaining up on the top 
top, I can see distribution. And if I go into the second tab, I can see I've had a total of 23 grams of protein, which leaves me for 249 for the rest of the day, 26 grams of carbs, which leaves me 246 grams for the rest of the day, and one gram of fat, which leaves me for 59 grams of fat for the rest of the day. Additionally, what you can do is you can go in as well and log things in before you have them. And that typically helps you kind of plan out your day a little bit more efficient. So if I know what I'm having for lunch, I can jump in here and log exactly what I might be having for lunch. And that's essentially it. You've now logged all of your foods. You know exactly what you're consuming, what you can consume throughout the day, and you just have this number to keep hitting. One of the main reasons I recommend my fitness pal is just because the amount of restaurants and supermarkets and food options that are already logged in here accurately, you're most likely to find whatever option within the app. Again, it might seem like a lot, but as you as you start using it every day, it really becomes muscle memory. It's quite simple to just jump in, select the foods that you had or select new foods that you're going to do and just have a clear understanding of where you're at for that day. All right. So the last thing I wanted to share were some best practices and answer some frequently asked questions I typically get when it comes to macros or calorie counting. If you're a big overthinker like I am, then this section might be pretty useful. Are calories all the same? No. There are various things that factor in like nutrient distribution, how full you get, and much more. There's a lot that goes into nutrition. What's worked best for me is focusing on nutrient dense whole foods for most of my diet that keep me full and feeling healthy, but balancing it out with those pop tarts and, and highly processed foods that keep it realistic and sustainable for me in the long term, which is what matters. The whole thought process of unhealthy versus healthy foods. It's a very controversial topic and there it, it's a whole video in and of itself, but remember food isn't just calories and nutrients, it's also memories and experiences. So to me, it's important to balance those out. How I typically approach this is first, I wanna make sure, am I actually stuck? So I'll look at the average weekly weight that I've been logging and just look at the numbers and see, have I been consistently at the same weight despite hitting my caloric deficit? If that's the case, then I'll look at the progress pictures I've been taking as well and see if I see any changes there. There are some instances where I might not be losing weight, but I see drastic changes in how my clothes fits or my pictures, which tells me I might be gaining some muscle while losing some fat. So I don't have to make any changes. Now, if I don't see any physical changes and I don't see any changes in my average weekly body weight, then before dropping calories, I'll look into my physical activity. And are there any comfortable changes I can make to increase that physical activity so that I can increase the amount of calories I'm burning without modifying the calorie that I'm touching? Again, it's important to note that I want to make sure that this is comfortable and sustainable for me because physical activity alone can't outperform a bad diet. So this does not mean I'm going to be doing cardio seven times a week for an hour on top of all my workouts just so that I don't have to change the calories. That's not sustainable and that's probably not helpful. Now, if I determine that I can't increase my physical activity at this moment, then yes, I might consider dropping my calories. That being said, it doesn't mean you have to just slash off 200 calories from every day. Typically how I approach this is I'll, I'll then move on to high days and low days. The high days, I'll maintain the same exact macronutrient and calorie distribution. And then I'll add one to three days of that week are low days where I'll decrease those calories. Over. This makes it a lot more sustainable and easier because I'm, although I'm dropping my calories, I'm not dropping them on a daily basis. I'm more so looking at the weekly caloric intake and dropping that. When dropping my calories, I typically focus on dropping the carbohydrates and a small percentage of fats. Because I'm interested in keeping and building muscle, I don't want to touch my protein. Also, those calories keep me full and it's quite dangerous to lower your fats too much. So for me, I generally focus on those carbohydrates and a little bit of fats after a long period of time. I get this one quite often. And the truth is, as long as you're consistent and it's matching the nutrition label serving size that we spoke of beforehand, that'll typically define whether it's raw, measured raw or cooked, then you should be fine. I personally prefer to measure it cooked. It's easier for me, has a little bit less variance because of the water content in the foods. So that's just what I chose. But again, it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent and it matches nutrition list. Absolutely not. Counting calories and macros is just another tool in the arsenal to create a healthy, sustainable life. For some, it might not be necessary at all. To some, I wouldn't even recommend it. If you're working on your relationship with food, then maybe counting every single thing that goes into your body isn't the right choice for you. And that's perfectly fine. Or you might have certain health concerns, etc. The truth is nothing's gonna substitute a customized plan. All of our bodies are different. All of our health profiles are different. So if you are within means, find a customized plan, ideally with a registered dietitian or someone that works 
alongside registered dietitians. However, I did want to put this video out there because it can be a really useful and powerful tool and it's worked wonders for me. Not everyone has access to those customized plans and you might not be there yet. So I wanted to put something out there as a starting point that can help. So if you found any of the information or resources in this video useful, feel free to like and comment below. Also, if there's any questions that weren't covered in the frequently asked questions section, then ask them down in the comments below and I'll love to answer. If you want to take a look at what I typically eat in a day, then check out this video right here. And until next time, progress over perfection.